This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. The news in the church this past week has been so bizarre that this incredible story kind of almost got forgotten in the cycle. Right when Archbishop Vega knows news hit the cycle, we all kind of been, been focusing on this news that has been confirmed by multiple sources, apparently, that Rome is going to issue, probably in July, a document further restricting the traditional Latin Mass. Catholic Culture's website run by Phil Lawler confirmed through sources in Rome that it will be eliminating the diocesan traditional Latin Mass, meaning you can only get the Mass, that form of the Mass, and those traditional uh, sacraments from groups like the SSPX and the FSSP and other similar kinds of organizations. That at your cathedral mass, your typical diocesan parish, they won't be available. A couple questions that have emerged from that is, how about religious orders? Will they have public masses available? We have no confirmation on that yet. Don't be surprised if the document includes something to that effect that restricts their ability as well. But in that debate, we had this incredible interview from Professor Andrea Grillo from Mesa and Latino, which was done in, I believe, Spanish originally. Then Marate Chaley translated it to English, and the thing took off across uh, the Internet in the Western world, and for good reason. He is a theologian, a liturgist, who is highly influential, at the very least, in Vatican circles, to the point where, while he denied being involved in writing Traditionis Custodis, his fingerprints were all over it, to, again, the point where some more traditionally minded liturgists have said that he should file a complaint for plagiarism with the Vatican. To give you an idea, and his his statements were so out there, so bizarre, that Eastern Rite Catholics took notice when it became pretty obvious that in his mind, his very influential mind, that all Catholics everywhere, not just Latin Rite Catholics, but all Catholics everywhere, should worship in the Novus Ordo. That would mean the elimination of the traditional liturgy in all of its forms. I have for you today an interview that broke over the weekend and kind of got lost in all of this because, again, of the Vigano story, which took precedent. And I normally save letters and things of that kind for weekends, but I don't want the story to get lost in the cycle anymore. So we have this from Don Al Dom Alquin Reed, and he's a fairly controversial uh, figure in the church, always... He's always defending tradition in light of even like the personal risks he was taking that have cost that have cost him quite a lot of standing in the church. But he took on Professor Andre Grillo in a statement here, and I will provide you the statement in full with some commentary throughout. I want to stress something here. This debate will continue to go and on and on until we have confirmation one way or the other about this doc this alleged document that's supposed to come from Rome. So, Rate Chaley published this. We'll give you some commentary throughout, and I will have a link to this in the show notes at returntotradition.org so you can read this for yourself after this is done. Exclusive, Don Alcuin reads response to Professor Grillo's interview. Wrong, Professor Grillo, think again. But Dom Alcuin read. Amidst the liturgy wars of over a decade ago, Father John Baldovin S.J. published an article Idols and Icons, Reflections on the Current State of Liturgical Reform, published in Worship and Magazine 2010. He argued that some were given to the idolization of certain ritual forms, complaining that he found, quote, a paradoxical kind of narcissism in certain attitudes towards the liturgy in which people think they are arguing for more transcendence at the same time as they are promoting an idolatrous attitude towards the liturgy itself. Barring from the French phenomenologist Jean-Luc Marion, Baldivin argues that the liturgy should instead be iconic, whereby, in Marion's words, quote, the icon does not result, result from a vision, but provokes one. It summons sight in letting the visible be saturated little by little with the invisible. Baldivin quotes further, In the idol the gaze of man is frozen in its mirror. In the icon the gaze of man is lost in the invisible gaze that visibly envisages him. Father Baldovin is careful not is careful to assert that he does not consider quote the traditional Roman right to be idolatrous itself, but that he does think that quote the attitude of insisting on it or a return to many of its features, a la a reform of the reform, 
that would be your reverent Novus Ordo Mass, is idolatrous in the manner described above. He makes a good point. The sacred liturgy is not a dead idol to be worshipped. It is indeed a living icon into whose gaze our own is drawn, transforming us and forming us in that which is the source and summit of all Christian life. His important distinction came to mind when reading Andrea Grillo's recent interview with Mesa and Latino. For if there was ever an example of the idolization of certain ritual forms and, quote, a paradoxical kind of narcissism in certain attitudes towards the liturgy in which people think they are arguing for more transcendence at the same time as they are promoting an idolatrous attitude toward the liturgy itself, it is here. Professor Grillo, Grillo gets it in one. End quote. <laughs> that is an incredible takedown of Andrea Grillo's entire argument in one go. And we're not done yet, though. But we need to bring you to your attention some other ideas here. Those of us who defend the traditional Mass, who invite people to go and check the traditional Mass out, even if it means a long drive, who want it at their parish, all of that, we often get called narcissists, that we want to impose our ideas on everybody everywhere. In the exact way that was apparently done after Vatican II, by the way, when the traditional form of the Mass was stripped away from the Church, and a lot of people were trying to talk themselves into how great new, the new order of things was, at the same time that their priest was now whipping out acoustic guitars and, and turning it into a, essentially a glorified concert. Thankfully, many of the bishops did clamp down on that to a degree after that happened. But the narcissism is there. We see this in when anybody calls us schismatic for wanting to worship in the same way that the, our ancestors all worshipped. They We get called schismatic and narcissistic because we want to believe the same things that Catholics have always believed. And we demand that the Church act as if she believes the same things that Catholics have always believed. And we get called narcissistic because we believe that the Byzantine rite of the Church, and the Maronite rite of the Church, and the Cyril Malabar rite of the Church, and any other Eastern, the, any other Eastern rites, that, in traditional rites you can name, we believe that those should be offered in keeping with their traditions as well. That the, the liturgies of St. John Chrysostom and St. Charbel should be offered with the utmost respect that they are due as divine liturgies of the Church that go back to also to apostolic times, more or less. We get called narcissistic for that. The real idolatry here is held by some in, uh, who defend the Novus Ordo. Let me emphasize some who will demand that the church be man-centered. They actually admit that the church is man-centered now. And they believe that that is a good thing, that that is the divine will, that the liturgy should focus on man rather than God. How that's not narcissistic and idolatrous, I don't know. Again, that is held by some theologians who defend, certainly not all. There are some who actually have a Catholic view of the new Mass. I know that will ruffle some feathers among the more hardline traditionalists when I say that, but certainly not every single person and every theologian who defends the new order of Mass is a raving modernist who demands that we essentially worship one another at the Mass. But this we're not quite done yet with what Tom Elkin Reed has to say, because the rest of his takedown here is incredible. Quote, for if there's one thing that we know for certain, thanks to some very diligent investigative journalism, it is that the current authoritative reign of fear against the usus antiqua of the Roman Rite, the preconciliar liturgical forms of the Mass, sacraments, sacramentals, etc., for which one could almost call the good Professor Grillo the press officer, is born of precisely such a narcissistic idolization of the liturgical reforms promulgated after the Council. They are carved in stone. No talk of their reform is permitted and talk of their being left aside in favor of the living and growing use of the usus antiqua is simply an abomination that can no longer be tolerated. It suggests the unthinkable, that all the blood, sweat, and tears shed in changing the liturgy was not necessary after all, and no one can possibly be allowed to say that. Indeed, this is regarded as such an abomination that a group of aging cardinals in Rome, mostly not in pastoral ministry, strategized to organize a survey of the world's bishops in 2020. It seemed like asking politicians if they would like a pay raise, except that from what we know, many of them said they wouldn't. That is to say that the leaks we have of the unpublished survey results suggested that the world's bishops do not regard the use of Santiqua as a problem. It was not being worshipped like an idol, but was in fact increasingly serving as an icon of him whom we are called to worship. The eminences were not to be deterred, however. 
By hook or by crook, the Holy Father was persuaded to replace Cardinal Seurat at the Congregation for Divine Worship with Archbishops Roach and Viola and to sign off on the infamous motu proprio, Traditionus Casodotus, in early July 2021, with the henchmen already in place to ensure its merciless implementation. The liturgical reform following the council that the Pope had curiously found need in 2017 to affirm, quote, with certainty and with magisterial authority as, quote, irreversible, was established as, quote, the unique expression of the lex orandi of the Roman Rite, i.e. the only truly legitimate way to worship, to which the recalcitrant resorters to the usus antiqua were to be converted, by coercion if needs be, in the constant search for ecclesial communion, as Traditionus Custodus insists. Some have attributed the curious expression, the unique expression, to Professor Grillo's influence. To my knowledge, he has never confirmed this, but if the hat fits... Archbishop Roach lost no time in sharpening Traditionus Custodus with, with authoritarian clarifications in the name of the Holy Father, such as insisting that altar servers at the Usus Antiquor have the diocesan bishop's permission and that no such masses be advertised in parish bulletins, etc., with the stated intention that all were to be brought to, quote, the unique expression of the Lex Arandi of the Roman Rite. That means the new mass. The com campaign to this end has been waged constantly since, with the prospect of another piece of legislation in the offing that would deal with the use of Santiqua once and for all, for all being currently reported. Amidst all this, Professor Grillo has been smugly confident in his assumption that those whom Pope Benedict XVI noted, quote, have discovered this liturgical form, felt its attraction, and found in it a form of encounter with the mystery of the Most Holy Eucharist, particularly suited to them, are in fact, as he asserts in his interview, backward-looking people who do not understand the meaning of tradition, and who form, quote, little more than a sect that experiences infidelity as salvation, and is often linked to moral and political positions, presumably he means bad ones, and very concerning customs, and who cultivate nostalgia for the past. Included in this damning slur are the 18,000 Chartres pilgrims, the future of the church in France, according to one French diocesan bishop, the faithful and heroic Catholic families who dare to have children and raise them with the traditional liturgical forms, the seminaries, monasteries, and religious houses, where the usus antiqua is the living, beating heart, and of course any academic who dares to defend its ongoing value. They are all members of a high society club or an association aimed at speaking a strange language or identifying with the past, cultivating reactionary ideals. The use of the dead language of Latin is deprecated, even though the Second Vatican Council insisted that it be retained, and even the poor Kappa Magna, the cer ceremonial train for bishops and cardinals that is still an option to reform liturgical books, is condemned, all because tradition is not the past but the future. End quote. The Kappa Magna is, uh, you, you'll see it mostly in, uh, I think Cardinal Burke wears one. It's the long, flowing robes and things that you don't see too often. They not only hate the Mass, but any of the trappings that go with it. Hence why Traditionus Custodus also called for stopping bringing any traditional accretions, as they called it, from the traditional Mass into the new Mass. Your reverent Novus Ordos are indeed on the chopping block. This is not just about traditionalists and their Latin Masses, traditional Latin Masses, pre-conciliar forms of the liturgy. This is about reverence and worship more broadly. When you understand that, then you understand what it is that they're trying to do to the Church. Let's go back to this. Quote, if this interview was not with a professor of a Roman pontifical university and, and, and at an important Italian liturgical faculty whose ideas seem to have some influence over the policies of the Holy See at present, it would be eminently discardable. But because Professor Grillo is indeed thus placed, it is, its risable ravings are very important for the sheer lack of theological depth and pastoral sensibility and experience they demonstrate, and indeed for their exposition of the sheer fear that the partisans of the Usus Recentior have for the Usus Antiquor. That'd be the, 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 the use of the Mass that's recent versus the ancient use of the Mass. Ironically, Professor Grillo complains loudly about poor reasoning. Let us take his fundamental assertion that, quote, tradition is not the past but the future. Our Lord taught that, quote, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. Pope Benedict XVI, in clarifying that the use of Santiquor had never been abolished and was therefore always of principle permitted, and in recognizing its pastoral value in the 21st century, and freeing it from any restriction, acted accordingly. Good theology and good pastoral practice in my book. Tradition is neither the past nor is it the future exclusively. Tradition is the living presence in the church today of all that has been handed down from the apostles and developed over the centuries in the life of the church and her worship, doctrine, and customs. 
In the first place, it obviously includes that which has directly been revealed by God, to which sacred scripture is singularly privileged and inspired testament. But the sacred liturgy is the place in which this tradition lives, where the scripture is read in context, where we offer our first fruits to Almighty God and worship as best we can, as the magnificent yet diverse forms of ecclesiastical architecture, liturgical music, vesture, and other forms of liturgical art demonstrate. The very rites of the liturgy and the things they employ themselves become sacramentals, created things privileged to reflect the holiness of God through their use in his worship. They cannot be treated profanely or discarded at will. It is for this reason that, as a recent pontifical document reminded us, popes and bishops are, quote, custodians of tradition, which implies all that a previous pope taught when in respect to the papal office and mutatis mutandis, the sacred liturgy. He said that, quote, the power that Christ conferred upon Peter and his successors is, in an absolute sense, a mandate to serve. The power of teaching in, ch in the church involves a commitment to the service of obedience to the faith. The Pope is not an absolute monarch whose thoughts and desires are, are law. On the contrary, the Pope's ministry is a guarantee of obedience to Christ and to his word. He must not proclaim his own ideas, but rather constantly bind himself and the church to obedience to God's word in the face of every attempt to adapt it or water it down in every form of opportunism. That's a quote from Benedict XVI, dated 7th of May, 2005. Hence, it is difficult to accept the pure positivism that underlines Professor Grillo's idolizing the post-conciliar reforms. The previous liturgical forms were sacred and great, and can most certainly be sacred and great today also. The fact that this fe instills fear in those who have staked their reputations and careers on a questionable act of papal positivism, the imposition of new rites that are not that for which the council called and that are not in organic continuity with liturgical tradition developed over the centuries, and that they are fueling the opportunistic imposition of their ideology, whilst they have the political capacity to do so, does not change the truth that whilst tradition does indeed develop, it does so organically, by enrichment, not by root and branch, reform, or substitution. Otherwise, nothing is true. Nothing has value. Everything is simply a matter of political expediency. That is why Pope Benedict did not err in teaching, that what earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too, and it cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden even or even considered harmful, and that it behooves all of us to preserve the riches which we have which have developed in the church's faith and prayer, and to give them their proper place. To be clear, this does not mean the Pope cannot legitimately propose a new liturgical development or rite as did Paul VI, but it must earn its place in tradition on its own merits, as it were, and not through positivist imposition by authority, nor can it be sustained on dishonest subsidies. If it becomes part of the tradition, so be it. If it suffers the faith of the innovative 16th century breviary of Cardinal Quisnones, propped up for decades by papal support before its long overdue passing away, then so be it also. Conversely, one must say that if a right continues to live and breathe and bring forth good fruit, even in the face of papal opposition, it is very hard to deny that it has a legitimate place in the living tradition of the Church today and in the future. End quote. The rest of that goes on to uh, go after his, or Professor Grillo, to be clear, his lack of pastoral sensitivity. And why would he have pastoral sensitivity? He is, after all, a college professor who is intent on forcing the continued reform of the church into his own image and likeness, burying the traditions of the faith forever in a distorted sense of what tradition is. Professor Grillo redefined tradition to mean essentially that tradition is whatever we say tradition is, which is not the church's view of tradition. The church has a very clear definition of the tradition, which Dom Alcuin Reed brought in his essay there. There's more to it than that, but in the sense of in the need for brevity, we will leave it there. The If you want to read the full document for yourself, it's at Rurate Chaley. I'll have a link to it in today's show notes at returntotradition.org. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It certainly does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.